Okay, good afternoon, um, everybody. We are pretty much there on two o'clock. My name is Abby Whitehouse. I'm going to be chairing this first webinar on Ask About Asthma and Air Pollution. We've got some fantastic talks for you today. Um, I'm just going to move on to the um, housekeeping slides. Um, so please do keep yourselves on mute. If you manage to unmute yourselves, um, we'll mute you um, back again and we can use the group chat feature to ask questions and please ask as many questions as you can we've got time um, at the end to chat with everybody that's talking we are being recorded and there will be a link available after the webinar with the slides um, so if you have anything you miss or you want to come back to it then we'll have those ready for you um, I think as we're after uh, one o'clock we'll go on to our agenda so first up um we will have tom parks from camden who's going to talk through his um uh borough based approach to improving air quality helping children and young people with asthma live their best lives then we're moving on to the team from warsaw with connie jennings and bib marsh and then we'll be moving on to the team from merton's children's asthma project um, as I said, any questions, please pop them in the chat. And otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Tom, um, who's going to tell us all about um, the Camden project that he's working on at the moment. Thanks, Abia. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Tom Parks. I'm the Air Quality Programme Manager for Camden. So um, I've got a few slides to talk to you about how we have developed an approach for improving air quality as a way of trying to uh, reduce the extent to which air pollution affects children's health in relation to asthma. So I'm hoping you can uh, see my slides if someone could just give me a thumbs yeah, up we can. <laughs> brilliant okay <laughs> thank you um so yeah i'll just crack straight on with it then so just a, a bit of uh, an overview and we'll obviously get into this in more detail as i go through the slides but the key point is that local authorities have a statutory duty to improve air quality it's not necessarily about public health but it's about reducing air pollution um, and that causes some challenges but also there's opportunities there as well we need to recognise that air pollution is something that exists both outdoors, but also in indoor environments as well. So at home, at school and at work and in other public spaces. It's really important to, to understand that air pollution contributes to health inequalities and to have that in mind as we're thinking about how to improve air quality and to reduce how air pollution affects people's health. Um, we obviously know that children, young people have the most to gain from breathing clean air in early life. So they have they're probably the most affected by exposure to air pollution, but there's the most to be gained from improving air quality and reducing their exposure to pollution. Um, there are things that we can all do to reduce air pollution individually and collectively and to reduce our exposure to it. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't really know much about how air pollution affects their health or what they can do to mitigate that risk. Um, so there's a really important role for local authorities to tackle air pollution but also to work with health professionals and the health service as a whole to build public understanding and to empower people with the knowledge and the awareness to try to protect their own health by reducing exposure to air pollution as a trigger for poor health. Um, so a bit of background then, what is air pollution? In this public health contact, context, um, when we talk about air pollution, we're thinking about things that have a direct effect on our health. So in the you know, in the current time, that generally refers to a couple of different types of air pollutants. So nitrogen dioxide, uh, which is an invisible gas produced by burning fossil fuels, and particulate matter, which is a really broad category of airborne particles from different sources that can affect our health in, in different ways. It's a bit of background, background noise, if anyone could uh, mute themselves if, you're, if you've got your mic on. Um, I'm just listening. Okay, there we go. Um, it's important to know that the air pollutants in this context is not the same as carbon dioxide. So CO2 obviously is a, a driver of the climate crisis and, and global heating, but it doesn't have the same sort of physiological effect on our health in the same way that these air pollutants do. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, air pollution exists indoors in our homes as well as outdoors. And our understanding of what air pollution means has changed over time. So I'm sure many people will have seen the, the classic images of the great smogs in London throughout the 50s and 60s. Um, fortunately, it doesn't really look like that in the UK anymore. But that's not to say that air pollution isn't still very much present in our cities and, and in other places and still having an effect on our health. So it's almost in many ways more insidious because we can't see it as clearly, but it's still damaging our health and 
especially the health of children and young people. The problem is, is that air pollution is the largest environmental risk for health. So it matters because it's a cause of a huge number of premature deaths each year in the UK, including a lot in London. Uh, and in Camden, the public health statistics um, from OHID suggest that just under 8% of all mortality is attributable to long-term exposure to air pollution. And that's despite, as I mentioned, us not necessarily always being able to see when we're exposed to air pollution or how it's affecting us in any one particular moment. So it's often thought of as a silent killer or an invisible killer. Uh, and the World Health Organization estimates that a huge portion of global deaths from lung cancer, stroke, and heart diseases, and so on, are actually attributable to exposure to air pollutants. So it disproportionately damages the health of, of some people, uh, as I mentioned earlier on. So we know that some people are more susceptible to the damaging effects of air pollution because they may have existing health vulnerabilities. And we know that some people are exposed to higher concentrations of air pollution as well. So it has a disproportionate and inequitable impact upon health. And the graph on the right hand side there is, is taken from a, a presentation from Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, um, but it's a useful way of looking at how our cumulative exposure to air pollution over the course of a day is generally dominated by certain environments and, and times when we're actually in places which are really, really polluted. So, for example, if we're out commuting, either on a, you know, driving or on a bus or on a really busy road, but also whilst we're cooking indoors at home as well. Um, so we spend a portion of our time in really polluted environments, and that's a significant part of our overall exposure to air pollution. The, the reason that air pollution damages health, as far as we understand it, is because it causes inflammation. So nitrogen dioxide um, is a respiratory irritant. So it causes inflammation of the respiratory system. Um, particulate matter, the really fine particles, can pass over into the bloodstream where it becomes systemic and can cause inflammation in the various different parts of the body where it ends up. So that's why air pollution isn't just uh, a, a cause and contributor to respiratory illnesses, but also cardiovascular, neurological, endocrine um, disorders as well. We also know that some types of air pollution also contain chemicals which themselves have been classified as, as carcinogens by the World Health, Org Health Organization. Um, and overall, we know that air pollution has both short term and long term effects. So as well as contributing to the development of asthma in children and young people and, and restricting lung development, we know that short term exposure to really high levels of air pollution can be a trigger for existing conditions. So that's why when we have high pollution episodes, which occur a couple of times each year, we end up typically with an increase in people presenting to hospital and, and acute medical services because of the effect of air pollution triggering inflammation, which is, is causing symptoms of existing health conditions. So just to, to return a little bit to the health inequalities aspect of this, I mentioned earlier on that we know that children are more vulnerable to air pollution, so there is a potential for lifelong impact. Partly that's because their lungs are still developing, so a restriction on lung growth earlier in life is going to lead to you know, a longer term restricted uh, capacity in the lungs. But also we know that children are affected in terms of cognitive performance from air pollution, um, as well as the fact that uh, they, there's a higher rate of breathing as well. And sort of a fairly fundamental thing, but children being lower to the ground, if they're walking around really polluted environments near roads, they in many cases can be closer to the source of pollution. So it's a sort of a combination of additional vulnerability, but also spending more time in places which have really high levels of air pollution. We know that there's other elements to how air pollution causes health inequalities. So some people are more exposed to high levels of pollution because of where they live, whether that's near to a road, construction sites or industrial activities, but also because of housing quality. So overcrowding, poor ventilation and poor conditioned homes are likely to increase the, the risk of indoor air pollution and uh, reduced ability to be able to ventilate that pollution as well. So people spending more time in more polluted indoor environments and also less relevant for children and young people. But occupation is a really important way that people can be exposed to high levels of air pollution. So people working in construction, transport, uh, in, in commercial kitchens, for example, are likely to be breathing really high levels of air pollution. So ultimately, we know that um, air pollution causes a disproportionate and inequitable impact upon, uh, upon communities. And data from the ONS suggests that as the proportion within a community of black, Asian and minority ethnic people uh, increases, 
the long-term exposure to air pollution also goes up as well. So although air pollution affects everyone, it doesn't affect us all equally. And we see this in our data in Camden. So the data here is from 2021. Um, I think it's still the most recent data we have looking at asthma prevalence in children, young people. But you can see there is a significant variability in diagnosed asthma uh, around Camden. And the wards which have the highest prevalence of diagnosed asthma are also the wards which typically have quite high levels of air pollution, but also score really highly for indices of multiple deprivation and deprivation affecting children as well. And when we look at the, uh, the eth ethnicity of children in Camden, we can see that the prevalence of asthma is much higher among Asian and black children compared to white children. Uh, so I mentioned earlier on that air pollutants are formed from, from combustion activities, so from the fuels we burn in vehicles, but also how we heat our homes and offices, um, from construction activities, from transportation, from commercial cooking, and so on. So I think most people probably are fairly familiar with these outdoor sources of air pollution now. But indoor pollution sources are probably less broadly known, but no less important. So cooking, heating, smoking and vaping indoors are all major sources of indoor air pollution inside the home environment. But also things like chemical cleaning products, room sprays and fresheners, uh, candles and incense, and also decorative and furnishings um, as well are, are quite important sources of indoor air pollution that aren't that well understood um, but which can have a significant impact upon the indoor air quality and, and consequently our health over the long term as well. So ultimately this ends up in a need for local authorities to work with partners to improve air quality to reduce the amount of time and the extent to which people are exposed to air pollution um, both indoors and outdoors and I mentioned earlier on that local authorities have a statutory duty to measure and improve air quality. Um, and although that's typically focused on the need to achieve legal limits for pollutants, in Camden we've sort of gone beyond that a little bit and not seen there be much point in focusing purely on air quality if we're not thinking not think crucially about, about the health outcomes. So I'm getting a lot of feedback on, on that. Okay, that's a bit better. Um, so our focus in Camden considers sort of a few different elements basically. So we need to try to prevent people becoming ill in the first place. We need to reduce the triggers for people who already have illnesses and to reduce the severity of the symptoms for people with illnesses as well. So that includes uh, projects and, and policies to reduce air pollution directly, both outdoors and inside buildings. Um, we need to develop local policies and to advocate for regulatory improvements to achieve you know, a reduction in pollution and exposure to it at different scales as well. So there's only so much we can control locally, but we need to lead by example and work with partners to achieve change at different levels of policy making and governance, um, but also to build collective knowledge and awareness. So I think it's really important to instill a sense of understanding about how everyone is affected by air pollution to empower individual and, and collective change and community projects, which in many cases can be really, really powerful ways of uh, achieving a, a healthier, um, safer environment for people. So our programme in Camden consists essentially of an air quality strategy, which is the long term vision for cleaner air in the borough. So from a, a community engagement exercise a few years ago, there was a defining concept, which is that um, people should be able to live in Camden and not experience poor health because of the air they breathe. So that's been a, sort of, you know, one of the core um, long term, that is the core long term objective for our air quality programme in Camden, our, our borough strategy for clean air. And we've adopted the World Health Organization air pollution limits, which are much more stringent than the legal limits in, in the UK. They're based upon the sort of the latest distillation of science and epidemiology, which looks at how air pollution affects health and what we can do to prevent that. And we have a set of guiding principles and strategic commitments, which includes things like um, ensuring that we prioritize projects and activities to try to tackle the disproportionate impact of air pollution and to try to protect and improve the health of the communities which we know are most vulnerable to air pollution and those who probably also contribute the least to outdoor air pollution in Camden. And we have broken up our, our long-term strategy into four-year uh, delivery plans basically. So we have a clean air action plan which sets out a suite of outcomes for reducing air pollution and exposure to air pollution by targeting a reduction in, in pollution from transport, from building development, 
um, from buildings themselves, how we heat them and power them, and reducing exposure through public awareness and collective action, um, working in partnership with healthcare providers and individual clinicians in the borough as well. So I think that that partnership working is absolutely essential for us to be able to achieve the, the meaningful engagement that we, we need, but also to build a stronger case in advocating for, for stronger national policy and legislation to, to enable cleaner air. So just a couple of examples of the, the kinds of things we've been working on in Camden, and this is just a small snapshot of, of our activities, but and much of this is grant funded as well, so very, very dependent upon bringing in external funding for these projects. But the Year of Clean Air for Camden Schools is a year long programme to work with schools throughout the borough to um, build among pupils and the school community and parents an understanding of how everyone is affected by air pollution. But for children who may already have uh, asthma or a particular vulnerability, how reducing exposure to air pollution can help to alleviate one of the triggers for asthma as well but also using the pest power of children to try to you know, be a strong messenger for change as well. We have a project to improve air quality at home by um, loaning people who live in Camden indoor air quality sensors for, for a one month period for free. And that helps to better understand how exposure to pollution inside the home can occur and then what to do to reduce that exposure to try to make the home a cleaner and, and healthier environment. And um, we've done a lot of work with NHS partners and there's a lot more to be done, but we have had some, some successes in producing materials for the public, but also now looking at producing really useful engagement and training materials for clinicians, because some of what we hear from our partners has been that although um, health professionals may have some understanding of air pollution, there is perhaps a lack of confidence or detailed knowledge to uh, you know, enable and facilitate a conversation with patients about how air pollution is a factor in, in health and well-being. So trying to build useful uh, concise materials to support that conversation. And then projects to tangibly reduce air pollution outside schools and other environments as well. So for example, healthy school streets to reduce traffic pollution and support sustainable active travel. And just a final couple of slides really. So some challenges and opportunities. So a key point here is that councils are generally not trusted messengers. However, health professionals are much more trusted. So there's a lot to be gained by having a partnership approach between local authorities and local health professionals in a borough-based approach to try to reduce air pollution, but also build public awareness about what we can all do to reduce our own exposure to pollution. Similarly, local authorities tend not to have great reach to the people who are most vulnerable. So again, there's a real um, opportunity to, to get the, the important messages and the, the sort of information out there by working in partnership with various local health services primary and secondary care clinicians. And I think a really important point here is that climate change brings new challenges for air quality. So although we've seen air quality improve significantly over the past 10 years in London and elsewhere across the UK, this trend might not continue. We know that extreme heat tends to lead to higher levels of air pollution and a, a fairly large portion of deaths each year during summer um, extreme heat waves is actually attributable to ozone air pollution. So we need to be thinking about air pollution in the context of a changing climate, but there is an opportunity if we can build public awareness about air pollution now to build more resilient communities and, and more resilient um, people uh, later in life as, as climate changes as well. Um, I know I'm out of time, but the, the final recap of the point. So essentially a lot to be gained by working in partnership. That I think is the key crux of the message and that's both essential for, for now and the future. That's it for me. Fab, uh, Tom, thank you so much. I, no, you were almost perfectly to time, um, just the right amount of information. Um, so what we're going to do is bring all the questions together at the end for our question panel. So I'm going to quickly move on to our next team, um, which is the team from Warsaw. Um, and we've got Connie Jennings and Viv Marsh, um, who are going to tell us about um, the work that they've been doing there. Thank you so much. Um, so my name's Connie Jennings. I'm the Director of Stronger Communities for WHG in Warsaw in the West Midlands. So hand over to Viv. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Viv Marsh and I am the uh, Clinical Lead for Children and Young People's Asthma Transformation in the Black Country. Uh, next slide please Viv. So um, we're presenting today as a very strong partnership between health and housing. So me and Viv 
vow never to do this presentation by ourselves because it only works because we're working in partnership. So just a bit of context and background. So WHG is a place-based social landlord that provides 22,000 homes in 20 local authority areas. But what's important about that stat is that 19,000 of our homes are in Warsaw, which allows us to work at scale and within local communities and able to measure the impact very easily. 82% um, of our homes are in a core 20 population area, which means that they are some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged uh, residents within the local area. Within some of our uh, wards, they're in the top 10% of deprived wards in the country. Um, WHG have been uh, proud board members of Warsaw Together, our integrated care partnership for about five years. And we're very um, pleased to play our part in terms of reducing health inequalities, which are driven by the wider determinants of health. We've been working with Viv for around three years, who leads on our children and young people asthma transformation work, obviously as part of the Black Country Integrated Care Board. We also work very closely with um, our local hospital, Warsaw we'll, we'll Healthcare NHS Trust, and they are the people that provide the direct referrals to WHG for us to deliver interventions to. And last but not least, um, definitely not least, our, our George Collin Memorial Fund, which although is a small um, asthma charity, actually their intervention and the stuff that they provide um, the work with is really impactful and makes a really big difference to some of the work that we can do. Next slide, please, Viv. So I'm um, just going to talk you quickly through WHG's Community Champion Model. It's actually 20 years old. So it came to Warsaw through myself um, when I was asked to work in a very uh, underserved community in Warsaw who were very, very um, distrustful of um, any service relay. And I'm really interested in your um, trusted messenger, um, Tom, approach that you talked about because a champion is a trusted messenger. So um, the community champion model is that we recruit people that live in a WHG home, that live in a key geographical area that we want to work in and have absolute lived experience of the issue that we're trying to deal with. So if we're working with um, families where a child has asthma, we will recruit champions who have that lived experience of dealing with asthma either themselves or caring for somebody or being within a family unit where asthma has been um, a concern for people. What's really important is the lived experience. We call that their superpower because that obviously um, influences and impacts on the sort of work that we do. I myself come from a very similar disadvantaged background to some of the communities I now work in. And I use my lived experience of my brother going into hospital on a regular basis because of asthma, which was caused by smoking in the home. Social housing customers are the last group in the population to not able to give up smoking. And that's because it's a real stress reliever for them. So our champions are people that reach out into communities. They go to where people go to in their day-to-day -day life. So that might be the school playground, a supermarket foyer, a bus stop, a GP surgery, a place of worship. And they take the hand of, of people within their own communities and take them on a journey through the theory of change. What's really important to the work is that we always meet people's basic needs. People can't self-actualize if they're hungry or cold. Myself and Viv often laugh about an experience where I presented this programme with Viv to a group of NHS colleagues who um, we attended. It was freezing cold, um, the centre was really cold and everyone's dithering in their coats. And I asked people to put their hands up if they felt it engaged and creative. And of course, nobody did. And I said, unfortunately, that's the... Um, the experience of people who are in fuel poverty. So asking them to take um, responsibility to self-care for their child's asthma when they're dealing with the ability to feed their children and keep their children warm is sometimes an ask too far. Um, we call our champions Pied Pipers. They, they create a human bridge between the person that needs the service and the service. We use um, coaching conversations, which we call a clever conversation, using motivational interviewing to nudge and move people into a space where they can start to think about self-care. Our work is evidence-based. We use whatever our health partners want us to use, usually Warwick and Edinburgh or ONS4. And the model can be replicated. So we've used it to get people into work, to reduce loneliness and isolation, to move people into diabetes services and so on and so forth. Next slide, please, Viv. 
over so, to you. Thank you very much, Connie. And um, so just building on what Connie was saying about, um, you know, the model and how it's developed over a period of time, I would say that from my perspective as the asthma clinical lead, the model gives us a, um, an absolutely fantastic um, opportunity to focus it on children's asthma because it's ideally suited to children's asthma for people um, uh, living um, in poverty, for families living in poverty. And the one thing I would say about the community champions is that, um, you know, they really come from a place of developing, uh, you know, reaching out into communities with kindness and developing trust. And I think, you know, we all know how difficult it is to engage um, families in looking after their children's asthma as effectively and as well as we would like them to. To. And this is a real, um, as Connie said, a human bridge, if you like, um, um, to to working with um, families that are underserved. So setting the scene for the argument for applying this model to um, the, the Walsall Housing Group's community champion model to asthma, um, uh, just, just sort of setting the scene for that really, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here with this audience on an Ask About Asthma conference, but we all know how common asthma is. We all probably know that the UK has got one of the highest prevalence emergency admission and death rates for childhood asthma in the whole of Europe. Um, and that young people with asthma are more likely to have special education needs for mental health reasons, more likely to perform worse in exams and leave school earlier than those without an asthma diagnosis. So really feeding into poor outcomes for children with asthma. And, and one of the figures that I was most shocked to read about was the impact of asthma measured in disability adjusted life years was actually highest in the five to 19 year old age group as well as people over 60. Because as a nurse, when I think about disability adjusted life years, I always think about older adults. So it's quite shocking to think about that in, in, uh, in our children. So I think Tom set the scene absolutely beautifully around the impact of health inequalities. And what we see here from the wonderful Asthma and Lung UK and their Breathing Unequal report published last year is that um, health inequalities really do um, underpin the greatest challenge in children's asthma. What you can see here on the graph is children with asthma are highlighted by the pink bar. And in the most deprived areas, um, children um, uh, with asthma make up the single greatest percentage of emergency admissions um, to hospital um, by condition and deprivation level. So we know that children in the poorest 10 percent are four times more likely to be admitted to hospital. Um, and this is related to both poverty and the related psychosocial factors that Connie's already touched on a little bit, for example, um, smoking as a stress reliever, but also um, Tom has touched upon in terms of housing, where people live, etc., and also how that is disproportionately affect, affected by um, uh, ethnicity. So we were all really pleased to see that uh, children also got a core 20 plus five um, strategy, um, not quite hot on the heels of the adult strategy, but it did turn up. Um, and of course, asthma is the first clinical condition to be included in that strategy that really highlights the importance of asthma as a key clinical area to focus on when we're thinking about health inequalities. And we just wanted to share a little bit of information about the black country, the black country, 52% of people in the black country. If you don't know where the black country is, it's in the Midlands. It's a small, densely populated area in the Midlands, just north of Birmingham. It's made up of four distinct places um, and Walsall is one of those places. All of our areas are deprived, but three of them are much more deprived than others. Um, but what you can see, the map that you can see on the screen here is actually the whole of the Midlands region. There's 11 ICBs in the Midlands region. So the black country is uh, one of 11. And out of all of the um, 11 areas in the in the black country, you will see that um, uh, we have three places, three of our four places in the black country um, that are in the red zone, if you like, for children's asthma admissions. And I'm not sure what people, you know, when we think about uh, the percentage of 
uh, people living in the core 20 uh, plus areas, we need to remember, certainly for us in the black country, and I'm sure it'll be similar wherever you're working, that actually a third of that population is children and young people. And Tom's already highlighted really beautifully the importance of childhood and the, the you know, the impact of breathing clean air on children has got the greatest benefit of all. Um, this is just an example of our Black Country Hospital admissions just by our four different places. Um, Walsall is one of our most deprived places and has got the highest rates of hospital admissions. So that gives us a really good platform for moving forward for, with our work on um, trying to uh, work together in health as a health and housing partnership. Um, and as you can see here, so we're we're just approaching week 38. Um, you know, Ask About Asthma Week is always the week where we think about that rise, that onslaught of um, admissions and A&E attendances that we are, know that are facing us um, around the corner. But when we think about housing, it's really important to think about what those drivers for poor asthma control and asthma attacks could include. And they could include things like poor indoor and outdoor air quality, exposure to damp and mould, exposure to tobacco, smoke and vapour, overcrowding and, of course, viral infections. So um, I'm going to hand back over to Connie now uh, to take up the reins for the final few slides, um, as she mentions um, Awa Bishak, who you'll all be familiar with. You're on mute, Connie. I was trying to be polite. <laughs> what, um, what I'm really proud about at WHG is that we'd started the work before this little boy sadly passed away. So we'd started it based on another little boy called Hakeem Hussain, who died because um, his mum wasn't in a position uh, in terms of her own um, lifestyle to be able to care for her child appropriately. And he died of um, an avoidable asthma attack. Um, what's important to note about housing is that there is a lack of supply of housing and we often get letters from health professionals saying please move this child um, in order to help their health improve. Now if we could do that we, we really really would. There's 18,000 people on average waiting lists across the country for each housing association so they're, they're, they're not going to be moved so we've got to come up with a different solution to respond to the needs of um, children and families. So for, for ourselves in, in WHG, we are really clear about why we're investing in this health work. It's all around tenancy sustainment and social justice. So for us, it's not acceptable for anybody, regardless of, of you know, their background position in life, that they should um, die earlier um, than other people in the population do because of the wider determinants of health. So. Um, Awood is the person that sits on my shoulder every day when I'm thinking about the work that I need to do as part of um, the health system at, um, within the, the, the housing sector. Next slide, please, Viv. So um, we came up with health and housing as a proof of concept based on um, Hakeem Hussain, and then obviously it gained momentum because of Awood Ishak. What's really important to say is this is really a systematic approach. I couldn't do what I do without Viv and vice versa. What's most important is the partnership with the parents and the children, because if we don't engage with them on a, in a way that's um, appropriate for them and their needs, then there's nothing that we can do in terms of trying to improve their um, health outcomes. Really simple work. We identify uh, via the hospital referral system if we have a child that lives in one of our homes and goes into hospital with an asthma attack. They ask the, the parent permission to refer them to my service, yes or no. If they're referred, then what we do is um, connect them to our social prescribing team and our surveying team. What we do that's important, though, is that we take an holistic approach. We know from the data that both Tom and Viva shared that those children that are living in the most um, lower income families where, you know, the home might be cold in the winter, too hot in the summer, um, they don't have warm winter coats or shoes to be able to keep themselves warm and well in the winter. Parents don't have um, the money or sometimes the skill set in order to provide that, you know, good nutrition. And all of those connected um, lead to children disproportionately going into a hospital with asthma. 
and that just perpetuates disadvantage because they're then out of school parents then might have to take time out of work to attend appointments and that's where the system has unfortunately fell down there's not a lack of services for children with asthma in the black country there is a lack of access and equitable access to those services next slide please So um, our mantra for WHG is that we move the family or move the damp. These are some of the outputs and the impacts that we've had on, on our programmes. And as you can say, we're very proud to say, you know, if we need to move families, we will do that. What's interesting for us as a housing provider is that the proportion of people that are also in rent arrears. So we know that asthma and going into hospital are definitely related to um, people that are on a lower income. Uh, next slide, please. What myself and uh, Viv are working on at the moment is that we're desperate to get something, what we call asthma friendly homes out into the housing and the health sector. To be an asthma friendly homes, all you have to do is when you identify that you've got a child with asthma, that you prioritise that house for, for repairs around damp and mould. To be an asthma friendly plus home, then you can do that added value work around fuel poverty, child poverty, and ensure that families get all the interventions they need in order to be able to um, manage their child's asthma well and stop them going into hospital unnecessarily. Thank you. So that brings us to the end. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing now. And I think questions are going to come at the end. Lovely. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for telling us about that, your piece of work. And now we're just going to move on to our last group, which is the Merton Children's Asthma Project. Hi, my name's Rachel and I work in the public health team at Merton Council. And hopefully you can see our slides. That's it. Yep. Um, today you'll be hearing from representatives of the team working on this project from Central London Community Healthcare Trust who provide Merton School Nursing Service and various members of the Merton Council team. Pearl is the school nurse and lead asthma nurse on the project. Rashid is a public health apprentice. Jason is our mapping. Hayden is our mapping expert. Hanan is our clinical service lead. Me, public health and Tom from our air quality team. This is the session contents. This is the where we'll be going through the slides pretty quickly. So please do put any questions in the chat or contact us afterwards if you'd like to, to have more detail. In summary, the aim of our project is the very, pra the very practical um, got one, and it is to look at children's asthma in relation to their experience of air pollution at home, outside and at school, and work with the children, their families and others on the possible changes that will reduce, reduce the impact of that air pollution on their asthma. And I'm going to hand over to Hanan quickly. Hi everyone, I'm Hanan Elodouni. So um, this is very much a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, our school nurses work with the children and the families to help understand the experience of that child's asthma. So for this project, the children have an air quality monitor device and phone, which they carry with them at all times. <clears throat> the data from these devices is mapped by the council's GIS mapping team. We also have a public health apprentice supporting the parents with the monitor and the devices um, and their mobile phones. Um, we also have a project man management team supported by the members of the public health team and also uh, CLCH. So again, that's joint working. There's also a steering group uh, that meet up on a regular basis and we've got representation from NHS England London, Southwest London ICB, primary care and our asthma leads. Um, so this pilot received 30,000 funding from the asthma grant, but the devices were purchased by the local authority using a place grant. So back over to you, Rachel. And I'm going to hand on to Pearl now. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name is Pearl Boydi, and I'm the nurse on the project. So here are some examples of the project documentation that we have been using. So you'll find that the small picture on the left shows the information governance data flows, which were a key part of the project. 
The image on the bottom left is the device guide which Rashid put together for the parents and the children. And then the image on the top right is taken from the guides I put together for the children to explain the project. And it also included um, their consent form because we, we realized that it was important to get the children on board as well. So they needed to consent as well as the parents. And then the image on the bottom right is the daily asthma mood tracker that children complete on a weekly basis and share with me. Thanks, Rachel. Over to you, Hanan. Thanks, Rachel. So um, we piloted the approach with a number of children over the summer term, which helped us identify any issues early on. We have been working on these issues and the best way to get the data from the children's devices to the council um, platform over the summer um, will hopefully be rolling it out to all schools shortly. Thank you. They check the two most complex setup pieces for this project have been the information governance and sourcing a device which would meet our requirements. The complexity of the governance came because of lots of different partners. Um, and we had to, which required agreement from LMC, local LMC, London, the GP Federation, CLCHIG, Southwest London, the council and all the different data flows, and you saw the little image of the data flows in the earlier slide, all the different data flows are documented in a DPIA, which is which is held by the council. Um, the upside of all that work, and it took a number of, must have taken six months to work through all the parameters, is that we have agreement for the school nurses to access the practice records on EMIS to complete the clinical view of the child's asthma. And the a lot of the work that went into the IG agreement was around how we manage the data flows between CLCH and the local authority and not breach the pseudo anonymous requirement that we have on with the project. Um, and this, and this, it only, so as the result of the work that we've done, it is only the school nurse who knows the identity of the child. Each device has its own identifier, which pearls add to the asthma database, and we only send data to Pearl according to that device code. So the council never sees the the uh, the child's name in in any documentation. So having a very big separation of um, the data. Now, if I'm going to hand on to Rashid to just say a few words about the devices. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Rashid. I um, just want to give a quick update with the devices. So, when the project was originally conceived, we found these devices in the UK which looked suitable for the project. However, they became discontinued and we realized that it wouldn't meet all of our requirements. But after long searching, our place officer found a device that seemed very suitable in the US. However, it needed a receiver, which is it's just a phone. So um, the device connects to a phone and it can transmit the data that we collect from the asthma pollution device. So it had all the functionality and the only thing we needed to do was to remove all the apps on the mobile phone. So parents and kids can't use it like a normal phone. They will only have the app on there. And we're very grateful to Georgie for putting us onto the source for the free reconditioned ones. Um, the issues we're currently facing when it came to the pilot were that we need the parents to send weekly emails of the data to us so that we can map it. And this would take a really long time because all of the data is tracked in seconds, so by each second. So the way that we've created a workaround is that we are getting the data straight from the SD card that is inside of the asthma device and extracting it. So yeah, that's it. Um, moving on to schools with Pearl. Thank you, Rashid. So the project aims to reach 40 participants and we originally thought this would be from four possible schools. However, we discovered during the project, the pilot phase, that only a few parents per school would be interested, so they signed up. We have therefore winded it to um, other schools, all other schools in Merton, but particularly those in higher deprivation and poor air quality areas. And we are thinking about secondary school students as well on the project. We now realize we should have gone wider with the project. However, it's a key learning bit for us. And we are starting this. The benefit of starting small is we've been able to identify any issues and ironed it going forward. So we hope um, the project will 
we will rectify all the mistakes that we've experienced prior. Thank so you. there has been um, a good engagement from those parents who signed up onto the project, so which is really positive for us. Um, and I have identified um, a number of issues with the with children that were on the project with a diagnosis of asthma, and I've been able to support the parents with that. Um, I liaise with the parents on a weekly basis, so they complete the mood tracker and share with me via the generic email um, on a weekly basis, and they are free to contact me anytime they want, and we can liaise and support them. So I will now share one quote um, feedback from a parent who was on the project. We are very grateful for the feedback and guidance we received from the school nurse regarding our son's asthma management. And we were glad that we were offered the chance to take part in the pilot. Thank you. I'll hand over to Rachel. And um, Hayden, who is our mapping lead, is hopefully going to be able to share his the data sort of mapping live. What you're seeing is a slide copy of it. And Hayden, are you able to try and share your screen instead of me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just start with this. Hi, everyone. My name is Hayden. I'm the mapping specialist for this project, which essentially means like it sent a lot, a lot of data. You have to make sense of it, put it on the map and make it look nice, which is always good fun. Um, I've got some examples of the stuff that we, the devices are recording there, but I'll share my screen because I get to a live demo of some of the data that we've received. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can yes. see. Yeah, so this is one example of one child's recordings over a day. And you can sort of see where they start and where they go over the day, the recordings from the device. Right now, this is simply showing the PM uh, 1.0 value, but we also record the 2.5 and the 10.0, and those can be switched to. With this tool, we can zoom in to different parts and see their locations and the recordings at this time. And it's quite powerful to be able to zoom in to different areas and see where the PM recordings get much higher. So you can see up here, they've traveled to Hammersmith and obviously the recordings have gone much higher. Um, we could then use the tool down here to really drill down and filter to certain areas. So we can see that when the recordings are high up here, this was at 4 PM as they're traveling, but then when, when they're traveling back, it drops down. Um, this is one child's recording over one day. We can use tools like this to filter. Obviously, this is one participant, so we can't do more than this. And you can also filter by the PM 1.0 value. Um, we have the 1.0 points and the segments and the ability to add other layers as well. Right now, like I said, this is showing one child. But as we get more children and more days of recordings, the ability to be able to filter to different snapshots of time and participants, you can get a really meaningful view of uh, the recordings throughout the day and their locations as well, which is quite important and quite powerful. Um, and that's it for me, I think. Just a quick snapshot showing the tool in action. So Thank you, sharing. Hayden. I'm not going to go back to our last slide. It was just a very quick one on the next steps, which is get, going from that test phase to the full phase um, um, in the autumn term. And the key thing for us is it understanding the children's asthma, their perspective of it um, from their plans and from their clinical record and this quite detailed understanding of their experience of air pollution across the working day and night. So the recordings are 24 hours and I'm going to finish there and go back to yourself, Abigail. Lovely. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear from so many different parts of the team as well, because it gives you that different aspect from it and, it, um, and how you've all been working together. Um, fantastic. I hope um, everybody's really enjoyed the webinar so far. We've got time for a good few questions to the panel, and I've got a few already. But if you've got anything else to ask, please do um, pop them in the chat and we can ask them um, towards the end. Um, I'm going to start. Um, Hazel um, quite clearly um, pointed out earlier that the figures that we're using, um, particularly the ones that Tom mentioned, are related to outdoor air pollution. Have you come up against anything, Tom, when you're trying to use these figures to describe the work you're doing? And actually, you're also talking about indoor air pollution when we don't really know the extent of it. What, how, what's your approach to kind of how do you explain that to people? Yeah, I think that's a really, really uh, crucial point that, that Hazel made in the in the comments there. Um, 
it is it does make it quite challenging sometimes when we think about the relative amount of resource and effort we need to put into trying to tackle outdoor air pollution versus indoors and it obviously is quite hard to communicate clearly with people or with clinicians or uh, people who hold the purse strings for grant funding when we're trying to um, do something to reduce a perceived risk for health in the indoor environment if we don't know exactly how much of a risk it poses but we tend always just to, to take a precautionary approach in Camden. And I think it, it's worthwhile doing that for others as well. If we know that these types of pollutants outdoors can have a particular physiological effect on us and that the, you know, the overall data shows us that that has a burden across a community or a society, then it makes sense for us to try to apply, apply the same approach when we think about the indoor environment, particularly if we know that people spend more time there. So I think I know there's a lot of work going into better understanding the chemistry that takes place in the indoor environment to understand how these different pollutants react and interact um, but for the time being we're just being guided by whatever evidence there is already out there and trying to be as clear in communicating to to prevent the possibility that this stuff may actually be really quite significant for health and as you know as the outdoor air pollution does continue to reduce the, the sort of the relative significance of the indoor environment is going to become more and more important. So we need to probably uh, devote more of our time going forwards to what happens in indoor spaces at school, at home and in workplaces as well. Absolutely. And as the evidence emerges from all the projects similar to what we've seen presented today, and there's a lot more going on around the country and across the world, I think we'll get more of that data that will help us to make those bigger epidemiological statements. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Tom, but first of all, I wanted to go to Connie and Viv and ask what you, if you could pick one bit, which do you think your best strategy is for engaging families? What's, what's the thing that works the best for you over all the years that you've learned how to do it? Do you want me to do that, Viv? Yeah, I know what you're going to say, but you uh, can we have two? <laughs> yeah. Have go one, on, you go, one Connie. <laughs> one each. Are you on mute, Connie? Oh. Goodness me, it's Monday. Um, it's up for me, it's obviously a human being with lived experience reaching out to another human being and taking them by the hand. But we incentivise to use things like kindness bags. So a kindness bag might have something in there that is really relevant to that particular family um, as the initial incentive and hook. And then once you've got them hooked in, you then start to build that trust and relationship, which then gets them on the journey of change. Marvelous. And I would I would just add to that that um, part of the, if you like, the asthma intervention is not just the community champions and social prescribers working in homes and getting to know families and reaching out with kindness and developing trust. And um, there is an asthma specific intervention element as well, which um, includes things like assessment of control, signposting to appropriate resources and helping people get to GP appointments. But one of the other things we do is regular um, usually in school holidays as we put on some um, community-based asthma education okay. events um, and actually our consultant paediatrician comes out to these you know myself and my team as well as the um, community champions that the families already know and you know we, we could have an event with 70 par children and parents kids playing all fed watered um, and an asthma education element and the opportunity to speak with healthcare professionals plus others as well. Exactly I think it's it really is that integration across different um, different groups and then making sure you've got your community providers in there as well but I think the work that you guys are doing is absolutely fantastic. Um, just to the Merton team, um, where did you get your funding? You, you mentioned you had £30,000 worth of funding as well as the money for the um, devices. Where did that come from? And um, that come from Amber. The 30,000 was from Southwest London, I think from the NH uh, London, the asthma program. That is what I think. It, we were given it before I started on the post, but I think that's what it is. Um, the, we have a places officer in the council and this the, the, the funding for the device came from her budgets. Well, so okay. we will write up that side of it as we're mid project at the minute but we will write up the costing and funding side as well yeah absolutely and um you on the Merton team as well do you, how, do you provide feedback direct do you provide this um air pollution monitoring back to the pa patients 
um, to the children. Do they see where they've been as well? I can probably, she is our guru and readings, is our guru mm -hmm. on these things. But yes, I mean, the parents, they, because of the phone, they can see the track, what's tracked during the day. So absolutely they can. Um, don't know yet whether they are, and that's something that we, we need to follow up. Um, but we're also providing maps for Pearl to talk it through with the families. So that's the other side of it. So they can either use a device or Pearl will sit down with the child and the parents and take them through a map. Yeah. Lovely. And Pearl, have you had experience of them being um, shocked or surprised at where they've been exposed or is it all been kind of, oh, yeah, no, I expected that? Um, they've been OK with it. I think most parents who sign on to this project have an idea of where the air pollution is where. So they are not too surprised. Most of them are. It confirms their fears at the end of the day. So, yeah, I've had most people just say, oh, that makes sense. Lovely. Yeah, I mean, we get a similar experience in the children that we see through the Royal London as well, that the ones that are engaged and want to come and be involved, um, they've already got an idea of where things are. I mean, one of the biggest one that we found previously was actually the indoor bikes that I suppose are a bit more difficult to demonstrate, um, particularly around cooking practices as well. So I think that um, using all those little areas can be really useful to have those conversations. Um, has anybody got any thoughts on, we've talked about a lot about air pollution and pollutants in terms of external sources, but thinking about things like house dust mites, how do you bring that into your conversation? Do you, is it a separate thing to a pollutant or do you, do you bulk it all in together? Maybe Pearl, you're probably the best person to have these conversations with patients. It's all moved into the is. same conversation because the device picks up the um, data from there as well. So most of the time, if they realize that the, the areas of high pollution are within their home, they already have an idea and they're already fighting to make housing better for them. So it's like um, a confirmation of what their fears were from the very get go. Um, Viv, have you got any experience from the, obviously you've done a lot more work around the damp and mold. Um, Patients also question about um, dust as well in their homes. And do they expect that they need to put that out themselves, or do they kind of is again? Does it go in with damp and mould, or is it something that they learn how to deal with? Um, it's really interesting question, actually. I think that we've been so used to in the world of children's asthma, we've been so used to dealing with the allergic triggers for so long. Um, it feels like the air quality, whether that's indoor or outdoor or the, the whole shebang, um, it feels like that's the new thing that's been brought to the table. Um, and I would agree with Pearl. I don't think it's separate. I think it's all part and parcel of the same conversation from a, a, either a, an assessment, you know, as a, a clinician assessing patients or indeed supporting self-management. It all comes down to that tailored individual assessment. So, um, you know, a, a Connie's outlined beautifully, um, you know, the, the the families living in social housing by, by very definition are already going to be um, more likely to be in a situation where they're exposed to poor outdoor and indoor air quality. And um, so, you know, as a clinician, if I'm working with the family that I know live in social housing, then then that automatically will steer me towards that conversation. So to me, it feels like, it, you know, I love the work in London around helping clinicians have these conversations with families and to talk about it. I think that's so important. And for me, that's the real next logical step. Um, I can see Connie wants to add to that as well. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just going to jump in and we're going to put an evaluation link in the chat. Um, if everybody who's still here, hopefully most people are still here, could just complete that now just so that we can find out how we can improve for the next um, webinar. And then um, I'll head to Connie. Yeah, I was going to say, don't underestimate that it can be a really simple intervention, like so we might need a vacuum cleaner um, to get rid of those just dust mites um, but they might need appropriate bedding so those very practical non-clinic clinical interventions are sometimes all that's needed in in order to address that particular issue so yeah sometimes it's not that complex 
And, and that's where the working together comes into play and health from a health point of view is how knowing how to action that. And we're just not good at that in health. We're not, no, you know, quickly and easily. How can we put those things into place? And actually, that's what acing asthma gives us. It gives us the opportunity to do that. Fantastic. Um, Rachel, you put your hand up as well. Just just the last thing from our project, we hope that these gadgets will enable us to provide that whole 24 hour period monitoring of a child's experience of air quality. Often it's different parts of it. So going to that point about in, indoor air quality, we're hoping it will add that bit to the story for these particular children. Absolutely. And I think that's the key thing, isn't it? It's about personalising it, but also being able to pull as much data out of this. Um, I, and I think also when we have these kind of large scale projects, it's how do we make sure that everybody else knows what's going on somewhere else in the country? Mm -hmm. I think that's really key. So webinars like this, um, presenting work at conferences um, and getting things published is really key so that that evidence can then feed into that scientific evidence base as well even though we might we may feel like the work that we're doing is very clinical or um council based and actually at the end of the day it's all research and it's all evidence um and so we need to be make sure that everybody knows what's what's going on elsewhere because this work is all fantastic um i don't think i've got any other questions there's been a couple of other bits and pieces and conversations and emails in the chat um I'm sure that all our presenters are happy for their slides to be shared. Um, I'm looking for nods. Yep, lovely. Um, and also, I am sh I'm assuming that they're probably all happy for people to contact um, specific people to the uh, um, uh, within the teams. Um, if anybody's got any conversations, and I can see some networking already happening with um, Tom in particular. Um, and I will be feeding into the Merton team and asking for some uh, info on your um, air pollution monitors after the talk as well. Um, Marvellous. I think I'm going to bring this all to a, a, um, a close. I'm so pleased you, so many people were able to join us. Um, it's been a really interesting snapshot of what we can do, um, as particularly when we all work together and we're not all in our silos. Um, and bringing the councils and health and social housing all together means that we can improve the air both indoors and outdoors. And um, I'm really excited for where these projects might go. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>